We are all called to make disciples, but what does that look like in today's world? This is part two of a two-part conversation on discipleship in our culture today. Welcome to Talk Truth, where we dive into scripture, gain insight from community, and biblically answer life questions. Talk Truth will answer your questions submitted every other week. I'm your host, Danielle Flood. Let's open the word, gather together, and talk some truth. Today, we're wrapping up our conversation on discipleship with Pastor Russell, and if you missed part one, be sure to go back and join us. I was challenged to identify the differences between discipleship and then the one-on-one relationship that that means and that that's described in God's word and the one-way communication of social media or teaching to groups or posting because- Writing books and and so it goes all the way back. Um, We can all post and share, and but we're also all called to disciple. So let me pray together. Father God, thank you for your word how it teaches us and challenges us. Um, May we honor you today with our words and actions and be people called to your purpose, building your kingdom. And may listeners today hear your word um, in a new way. May they be inspired to look for ways to disciple, look for those people that you're pulling them into connection with, um, not leaving the other things there, but that being part of God's kingdom means we're called to discipleship. Amen. Amen. So our question, we're still on the same question. We have it. All right. (laughs) What does discipleship look like in our culture today? I wonder if this listener was comparing our culture to the biblical culture. Because we do have examples of, in the Bible, discipleship. Um, what, What do you think that looks like if you were to compare, say these are the examples we have to follow. This is how we should follow them or how this should be different. Yeah. Uh, Today is so fast. I think as much, um, in some sense connected to the 2000 years that have passed, but also in our setting where we sit here in sort of semi-urban, 21st century, highly technological, um, we, we don't have the uh, experience of going out to hoe a field alongside somebody for six hours by hand. Yep. We don't have the experience of sitting in the marketplace together all day while I sell my fish and you sell your vegetables mm-hmm. and we're in adjacent booths all day as the life of the you know sort of slow paced agrarian marketplace. Sure. And, and so that, that pace mm. um, puts this this burden of it, you, be, you better use your time intentionally. Time moves at the same speed, but we've stuffed it way fuller right. in, in our day. Um, off setting that, I I can I can communicate with you um, across miles and right. across. Uh, physical settings where we're not actually together uh, better than than our predecessors come, but it still comes down to time and intentional relationship. In a slower paced world that may have fallen out more organically mm. than it does, because we don't do anything for hours anymore. Maybe maybe guys that play golf might be the the, the one time or people who work together, but even workplaces are so, right. you know. I work in an agricultural organization. Yeah, A lot of my work is brain work, like by myself, there is no discipleship happening most of the time. But every now and then I get to go and pot up plants or weed a garden with people. And I'm jealous. I'm jealous every single time that I don't get to do that more. Because mm-hmm. we do have those conversations. You know, what is God doing in your life? How, you know, how and, have you seen him work? And I bet none of those are on your calendar as discipleship meeting. Nope, that's true. And I think that's an important thing to remember too, that discipleship quite often happens on the way to something else. Mm. 
uh, we, we call Jesus's followers the disciples, but they weren't wearing t-shirts with that written on them. They were his friends, his traveling companions. Yeah, his students. Um, but a lot of a lot of those, you know, if you take all four gospels and put them in a book, is one. If you put all four gospels in one binder, mm -hmm. and you realize it is a three-year story arc, it's actually pretty thin as yeah. narration of three years. Right. There was a whole lot going on in those relationships and those connections that didn't make the book. Mm -hmm. And in all of that, you know, we got up that morning and we ate breakfast together and we had a conversation about weather and clouds and how our families were doing as we were traveling. Right. Those were discipleship settings. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of both. I'm hearing we need to be more intentional. Mm. So suburban working mom here, you know, I need over to, scheduled, right? I, I need to intentionally schedule time for things to happen accidentally or organically. Oh wow, yeah, yeah. Um, when yeah, I mentioned the Stockdales earlier in yes. the a previous episode, Craig and Jean, who spent so much time with Gail and I when we were very young, and they were a little bit ahead of us. Their boys were teenagers. Our one son was a baby. Our second son wasn't with us yet during a lot of those years. And uh, I made the mistake one time. When I, you know, with my then baby Philip, I made the mistake of talking about, well, I'm going to try to get some quality time within this weekend. And Craig said, kind of pounced on me. Yeah. And and he said, you do know that's a myth, right? I said, what's well, a myth? And he said, quality time. It's a myth. Quality time happens accidentally when you set aside enough quantity time. Oh. I know that hit me in the face, and I thought, who I need to rethink that. Yeah. But you know what I think? I think he was right. I think that. That whole afternoon or that two or three hours spent, you know, putting, putting together his swing set in the backyard right. when he's a little bit older. Mm -hmm. And, you know, get, get daddy the, the Phillips head screwdriver. Nobody, that's a flathead screwdriver. The Phillips head looks like a cross when you look at it. In those, in those moments and that sort of stuff. And the conversations and the questions mm -hmm. and the rabbit trail mm -hmm. that happen when you have thrown enough time at a relationship for the relationship to breathe and right. move and you, you potting plants with your friends mm -hmm. at work. And up come these amazing moments, up come these amazing encounters where you really get to, oh, let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. Whew, you know? Yeah, so we have three little kids. They're bigger now. They would probably not want me to call them little, but they're 11, 9, and 6. Okay. And so we like to bike ride. And my husband and I were just talking about how some of the best conversations come out in bike rides. We talk about theology, and we talk about our fears and faith and just amazing conversations for these kids. And I always wondered, like, why it would be on a bike ride. You know what I bet? I bet that if you took those same topics mm -hmm. and said, tonight at 7.15, yeah. we're going to meet in the great room at the house for family disciple making time, and that is tonight's topic, boom, sit in a circle and let's talk about it. You're making faces. I know, it's so Be funny. Because it would, I think it would yeah. crash and burn. Right. But in that space, the ability to be together, to um, to like spend that time and talk about it, it does bring these conversations and. And I'm not knocking family devotionals and intentionality. No. I'm really not, right. but, but I'm, I'm so committed to this idea. And, and, and I admit, Danielle, a lot of this comes from my own observational history, right. but it is the relation. It's the ebb and flow of your, your, you and I are walking along together during this, during this part of our life. Mm -hmm. And it's not hard to see that, 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 that I'm a little bit ahead of you on this particular part of the path. Mm -hmm. And um, we're willing to have a relationship where, where uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pouring into you and you're gaining from it. And at the same time, you're, you're challenging and helping me to think through, okay, what you just said, help me understand that better, which is refining. You know, it's, it's just. Yeah marvelous when it happens. I also have the opportunity. So again, suburban working mom. And I think a lot of our listeners could be in that busy stage of life. Oh, you know, there's man. so much going on. We've decided that after the kids are in bed is the best time to try to meet up. 
And so we have these like opportunities to connect deeply and, you know, whether it's in the pool or on someone's couch, like this is our time just to be together. Mm -hmm. Those have been some of the most meaningful relationships and, you know, friendship building times, meeting those goals that are not needs that I've had. Sure. Um, that I, it feels like a life hack, you know, it's like, Hey, well, and, and our, uh, Gail and I too, during those really crazy, busy, um, parenting years, first years, years outnumber mine. I only had two and, and at two, you can still play man to man defense at three. You've had to go to the zone, but my, my rule of thumb, uh, Gail during during some of those years was a stay at home mom, mm-hmm. and when I hit the door, um, and during some of those same years, I, I was working for a church, but my role was more administrative, so my schedule was super predictable. And I'd hit the door at you know five fifteen or whatever it was, and from there till time to tuck them in, the boys were mine. <laughs> Um, dinner, notwithstanding, because right. dinner was it was a family thing. But like the okay, guys, let's head out in the yard, and, and oh, and bath time, and you know, the, we would wreck the bathroom, and it was like Gail, whatever All you worth it, whatever you hear, yes, do not open that door, because <laughs> there were super soakers, yeah. buckets, it was nuts, and everything was tiled, nothing ever got badly torn up, but oh, it got flooded, and. <sighs> chasing the rabbit of parenting and marriage yes. stuff, but it was, it was important time, even building foundations with my sons, mm-hmm. letting my wife look forward to my coming home. Cause, mm-hmm. cause I would come home and I would just in the car. Okay. I got to find a couple hours of hero mode here for her and for my guys. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the house would settle down. The kids would be in bed and it was like, Hi, sweetie, I'm Russell, you know? <laughs> exactly. And those were sweet times. Yeah. So what about examples of like outside of the home? Yeah. What are some ways that we could be intentional but have these opportunities happen naturally? Um, you know, work is, is obvious. Mm-hmm. We spend a lot of hours there. And I, I, as I said in the last episode, I've kind of had the advantages and disadvantages of working working in uh, up in the guts of the body of Christ with, with other people that have been in there with me. Good and bad. Um, neighbors. Mm. Uh, you know, a lot of us live in, uh, we're, we're, uh, those of us who are Southwest Floridians, and that's a lot of our, our audience, uh, we live in kind, kind of claustrophobic neighborhoods. Mm. At least, I don't know about, about your family, but ours is, you know, one of those neighborhoods where I can, I can walk between the houses and palm the walls. Can you really? House, house, house. Absolutely. Yes. They're single family homes, mm-hmm. but they're, it's, it's, a, it's a subdivision of house, 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 house. So my neighbors are close. And neither of my neighbors on either side, um, the guys, it's mm-hmm. two families, and neither guy um, pursues Christ with the degree that, that our family does. They're, 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 they're great guys, they're honorable guys, they're right. great neighbors, they're great dads and husbands as much as I can tell. Um, you can borrow things. Mm-hmm. You know, hey buddy, can I borrow your hedge trimmers? Uh, and have a conversation around borrowing hedge trimmers mm. that can become a real leaning on the fence out by that hedge and, and talking about life. And it's just not that hard for that to become a witnessing opportunity. Now, they're, they've neither one professed faith, right? but the, the sort of pre-evangelism, pre-discipleship mm-hmm. uh, with, with neighbors, it really comes down to is the open for communication and connection sign on my life. Mm-hmm. Gail and I had a family that were neighbors of ours when we lived in uh, Kentucky years and years ago. We called them the carbon monoxide neighbors. Because we never saw them. Right. Uh, they'd be, you'd see the car, and, and, and up would go the garage door, and into the garage would go the car, and the garage door would come down. I don't know that I even, to this day, know what they looked like. All you ever saw was the garage door and the car, the yep. car and the garage door. And, and we called them the carbon monoxide neighbors because whatever was going on was that car in that garage and in the, in the house, you know? Yeah. Well, whoever they were, they weren't going to have any uh, Second Timothy two two stuff going on either as students or as disciple makers. Right. No, it's easy in our neighborhoods to do that. You know? Yeah. To be even the ex- excuse of my family, or you know, we can just to the detriment of our neighbors. I think um, I feel called that we're in our neighborhood for a reason, for good. You know, to be a light there. Um, and so 
that's probably a conversation for another day. But. No, but but you're talking about making discipleships beyond making disciples beyond the just immediate and obvious blast radius of your family. Right. Danielle, that's what it, that's what it takes. It right. takes a my life is open. Yeah. To be used of God mm-hmm. or for God to use others, there are on ramps into my life where people yeah. can happen. And I think those opportunities may not be convenient. You know, they may not feel like we have time for this or, <laughs> you know, this is the something. You know, you know what my least favorite parable of Jesus is? Mm. It's the Good Samaritan. Oh. You know why? Because the bad guys in that parable are full-time religious workers with great time management skills. There you go. The full-time religious workers with great time management skills were on their way to the temple to do important temple stuff, important temple stuff, important temple. There's a guy in a ditch over there, and I'm sure that's bad, and I hope somebody deals with it, but I've got important temple stuff to do, and I have worked for 40 years to be a religious professional with decent time management skills. I'm on the wrong side of that parable. Yeah. Um, Ouch. You know. And out for all of us, yeah. you know, because we should be looking and finding those times. But when, I don't know, sometimes when it's not convenient, we know that it's, you know, something we should probably be doing. Um, so what are some of the joys or hindrances in our discipleship? Because we've talked about it's not easy, you know. No. Um, I, can think of, I can think of two hindrances, two big things. Mm-hmm. First, it's not efficient sigh yeah my undergraduate degree is in the design and auditing of computerized accounting systems okay i've never i'm i I have an accountant brain Mm -hmm. you know 90 degree angles and well aligned columns and tick marks and done Uh, discipleship is a much messier thing than that it's true. How do you how do you know when you've said enough or too mm-hmm. much or not enough or you can't objectively gauge the progress mm-hmm. of? You know, I guess you can look for certain tells, but you can't. You know, yeah. in that sense, it's 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 very agricultural. <laughs> you know, shepherding yeah. is not an accidental word picture for what it right. is to 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 do what I do for a living, but. But so it's so it's fundamentally inefficient, and so for task-oriented, efficiency-driven people, mm-hmm. the whole process feels laborious right. in that sense. Second thing, it can be heartbreaking mm-hmm. because there's a there's a mutual vulnerability between disciple maker and student. Um, I kind of got to let you in. Yeah. And you kind of got to let me in. And that can get uncomfortable mm-hmm. really quickly. Right. And it can get some version of even at least emotionally dangerous. Right. Because you uh, betrayal. Right. You know, this this is someone into whom I have poured. This is someone I've cared about. This is someone that I've, I, I know they know better. Mm-hmm. And then you see something going on in their life that's just horrific. And you go, no, 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 no. no. And you feel like, mm-hmm. I failed them. I failed Jesus. I failed something big. Right. So those are, those are, those are pitfalls. Mm-hmm. The joys, though. Yeah. I think the guys that have discipled me down the years. I know, because I... Um, Tim Hedquist, the one that I mentioned, is 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 long since with Jesus. Uh, Craig Stockdale lives in Memphis still, and every now and then he or Gene will throw a comment mm-hmm. on some McGregor thing that that uh, you know, and 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 an attaboy from him because he was there for me when I was in my twenties and just beginning to even take off my adult training wheels. Um. Because he, he, you know, he's been there for the whole story, at right. least with the beginning. Uh, what encouragement. Yeah. And, and I have guys down the years that I've um, walked with, uh, you know, um, and I see them sometimes really get it right. Yeah. And you go, I, 
I think I, I think I have a little piece mm-hmm. of, of, of building some of that. Yeah. And that's just off the scale. Yeah. We were part of the college and career ministry for yeah. a long time. Oh, I bet and you have a lot. Well, I had started a Bible study, you know, on an off day. And I had all these visions for it, you know, the big room and the big couches or whatever. But it ended up being four young ladies and myself. Okay. And we just kind of met and talked through the Bible. And it was so small. I wondered if it was worth it. I wondered if the time, you know, spent away from my little family, because, you know, when you have babies, getting time away from them is a big deal. But, I, you know, I was like, is this what we should be doing? Is this right? Um, and seeing those ladies walking for the Lord and keeping on and pursuing and raising their family and you know, just a little bit, like we had a little bit of, of that partnership together, just talking through what God's word meant and, um, I mean, I'm maybe a couple years ahead of them in the faith. Um, is it is it Second John or Third John where John says, "I have no greater joy than that my children walk in truth"? And he's not talking about his bio kids; he's talking right. about his disciples. That's true. No greater joy than that my children walk in truth. Right. And that's what you're describing. Mm-hmm. And and I don't know if the uh, many of our of our uh, talk truth audience are just getting the audio. But right. there is video, and I don't mean to embarrass you, but I, I, I would wish for people to see, as I saw, your facial expression while you were talking about that. Yeah. Um, that is a very happy thing for you, and I love mm-hmm. that. So how can our listeners take these steps toward intentional personal discipleship alongside of our church? Okay. Yeah, ch- church, church is important because church is the arena mm. and the context, I think, that, that kind of puts us in this big crucible together where we kind of find each other. Right. Second, you, you got to free up margin. The common thread through both of these episodes has been kind of time commitment. Right. Right. Um, and uh, empty nester, granddad. Uh, What'd you call yourself? Suburban working mom, I think was your self-label. It's going to, freeing up that time is going to be different in terms of difficulty, capacity, in a given moment, possibility even. But but it's got to be intentional, right? We spend absolutely no time on anything that we don't plan for. Right. Um, so not intentional as in, well, Tuesday afternoon from four to six, I'm going to make disciples, but, but living my life in such a way that I can grab occasions, I can grab moments Mm -hmm. and go with them. You know, it's funny, even, even to, even, even in this chapter for me, uh, often in my working life, lots and lots of scheduled meetings and lots and lots of stuff that, okay, here's the meeting, here's the agenda, here's what we've got to work on. But you know, the most, the the juiciest times are when I into somebody's office or somebody else into mine, they start with, hey, you got a minute? Yeah. Hey, you got a minute becomes an hour of real give and take that on the one hand is off task. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I have seen, well, a a real world example. Uh, Jeff Jeff Eskridge works as part of our media and design team. Right. And uh, off mic, uh, while we were setting up for this, we were talking about like those those sermon bumper things that we do here at McGregor that are the intro videos. Jeff and I will have just a, a conversation about, well, what do you think about the book of Genesis and what's going on there and back and forth and we're just throwing out things and somewhere in the back of our minds, we know there's a sermon bumper that has to happen, but it's a conversation. That's cool. And then all of a sudden I'm in church three months later fixing to preach on Genesis and it's, and here comes this trailer and the big British guy voice that's in this current uh, bumper and stuff. And I'm going, Holy cow, that's the conversation I had yeah. three months ago that I didn't plan, didn't schedule, didn't. Mm-hmm. And, and out of that fell, mm-hmm. you know, this yeah. amazing thing. And um, all kinds of topics start with the, hey, you got a minute conversation. And yeah. Some end up being work-related. I don't want our listeners to think that all we do is come to work at McGregor and hang out. 
But a lot of it without apology is bouncing obliquely, talking about life. And it ends up being, wow, I just, I just got discipled for an hour by somebody that I love. Yeah. And, that makes me think of someone. I have a standing meeting every week as we're planning this. He's a volunteer at Echo but he's taken on these roles to push Echo's mission forward. And so we're collaborating and he's discipling me. And it is so cool to, you know, be in this place where we can get work stuff done together, but also know that we both love Jesus so much. We both want to know him more. And I don't think, and you you as I work in a ministry setting, I don't think it has to be a ministry setting. No. I think if I work alongside somebody in the widget factory, and there are there are the conversations that happen while we while we build Widget, widgets widget. widgets yeah that's that well, that's the term for generic things that are manufactured right by Acme I'm sure yeah <laughs> widgets by Acme and and we and we take our break together and we run to lunch uh, in the break room and if I am a follower of Christ my radar is supposed to be switched on mm-hmm. for for there to be a sort of a kingdom utility for my conversations. Um, and I, I don't have to work at a ministry mm-hmm. to, uh, to have those opportunities. Without apology, it helps. You know, nobody's gonna come through the door and say, y- y'all are talking about God again, aren't you? Uh, yeah. But, but still, as long as your brain, your heart, and your vocal cords are connected, right. you can use discipleship. Well, and you said like pre-evangelism, yeah. pre-discipleship, then yeah. evangelism. You know, it yeah. can go to any any length. It I can. had a friend in my life group that talked about real conversations he has at work because they're in the truck together. Okay, there and, it is. Yeah, he's like, that naturally is where, where I talk to people about my faith and how we do it. And it's not all the time, but I think how you respond, who you are in front of your workplace people is is that opportunity as well. So we can do that intentionally, we can do it accidentally, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, And opportunistically. Right. You know, grab the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I think as we look at our digital world, our digital age, there's a place for teaching. There's a place for exhorting God's people, sharing Bible verses on social media, being kind to people. (laughs) You know, taking conversations and making sure that they would be something you would say one to one, be something that would honor God. If you're, you know, communicating yeah. on social media, don't don't check the fruit of the spirit at the door and go on full blast on social media because you're you're angry or something right. in the news has set you off or um, yuck. Yeah. You know. Now we do Because stuff to... lives forever. Once you put post, mm. you know, you hit send or post or whatever the button it says. Yeah. And that's going to live out there for a very long time. Plus the way people feel when they read what you said. Yeah. You know, I was talking to my kids and, they, and I said, you know, people won't always remember what you said, but they'll remember how you made them feel. Yeah. And um, my little guy said, well, what if I made him feel bad? Well, let's take care of that. You know, how can we fix it? He didn't like hearing that because, you know, if we do make people feel bad, we need to connect. Yeah. Not, not the same as causing them to ponder and end up perhaps in a place of conviction. That's not what you mean by make them feel bad, but, but feel like they've been on the wrong side of a knife attack because you felt like cutting somebody today and decided to use your, your social media voiced platform to do that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pastor Russell. Thank Um, you. I've been challenged. I think it's fun to separate those two and make sure that we're not thinking our social media posts are discipleship, but that we are commanded and are called to disciple outside of that. Um, And I want my social media life to partner with that intentional. Well, and you challenged me too. In episode one, I said that most of my own and because I'm over 60, of course, for me, it's Facebook, right? Yeah. I'm you know, demographically cliched. There you go. But I've, I, I said to you that much of, most, of, most of my personal activity on Facebook is grandkids and puppies. And I'm challenged by this conversation that I could use even my personal mm-hmm. social media platform a bit more intentionally than I have to be that exhorter encourager. 
uh, without having to haul the whole church media team along for the ride. So I appreciate the challenge as well, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you. And discipleship can happen on the way to something else. I bet when life is said and done, you're going to find out most of it did. Mm. Well, to our listeners, thank you for spending your time with us. If you haven't connected with us online, check us out, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And be sure to check out our other McGregor podcast channels. Just head over to talktruthpodcast.com for all the details. We'd love to hear from you. Give us your feedback however you're listening to this. Thanks for listening, and remember to talk truth.